Good morning, everybody. Uh, so this morning, we assemble for our exercise on uh, converting from SICS to FACO. Uh, in the next uh, one hour, 15 minutes, we'll be doing exactly that. But before that, we have a wonderful keynote address and uh, from one of our very renowned friend, uh, foreign faculties, uh, he's Professor Dr. Jud U. Ofra, and he is the uh, chairman of the University of Heidelberg. He's been in ophthalmology for the last 25 years with his main focus of work around cataract, refractives, glaucoma, and cornea. So in Germany, it's a culture to do almost everything. And uh, he's worked with IOL uh, labs with David Apple for a long time. He's a board member of e ESCRS and has been the president of the German Ophthalmic Society. So with these introductory words and his topic is explantation of IOLs which are becoming more frequent with us also. So a very apt topic and I invite Professor Ofra, please. Good morning. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. I'm going to talk about strategies for explanting intraocular lenses and putting new lenses in. And uh, I will divide my talk into sections. The first sections will be about patients that have already undergone faking intraocular lens implantation. And then after a couple of years, these lenses need to be removed because they get a cataract or have some other issues in terms of cornea. And this is important, especially as those who got a fake lens 10 or 15 years ago, there was not much choice. So they got like a PMMA and your chamber lenses and so on, which is not so, so easy to remove. These are my disclosures. So this is a typical situation we face more and more nowadays. Patient having an under chamber faking IOL, those are usually high myopic patients, minus 15, 20 diopters. And then you have to decide, how get I, do I get a, a big lens like this, six millimeter out of the eye? Uh, do, where do I do the incisions? And how, how do I handle that? Do I go through the sclera, the cornea? And it depends. If they have some astigmatism, you may actually go, and as in this case I did, through the cornea and uh, suture the uh, incision in order to reduce astigmatism by this, but then you have to do a second incision to do your FACO. So let's uh, go through this case. Uh, as you see here, this lens is a uh, anterior chamber lens, FACIG IOL, 6 millimeter, 5.5 millimeter optic, and uh, we will do an incision here after we put in the viscoelastic uh, at this plane here in order to get the lens out of the uh, and here chamber. For this I use a 2.5 millimeter knife and I extend this in a kind of frown incision uh, in the limbal area to have like a six millimeter incision here. Then we have to mobilize the lens and get it out of the incision like this. And you have to be careful, sometimes it is kind of adhered to the structures of the trabecular meshwork or to the iris. And then you can just take it with the normal forceps and get the whole lens dialed out, as you can see here. Then we will put a 10 uh, nylon suture here, bury the node, and go like here in order to do the FACO, which is then no, no big deal, as a matter of fact, depending uh, how much cataract you have. This is a myopic patient, so I have a deep anterior chamber, and it's a more cortical uh, cataract here and can be removed quite easily. Then I implant a lens without viscoelastic, just under irrigation. It's a hydrophilic lens from Zeiss, so we have the chamber open with irrigation, and then the lens is incited directly into the capsular bag, as you can see here. And though now the case is done, you don't need to remove viscoelastic because it was implanted under irrigation. This works quite well. Can you use a femto laser in case of an uh, anterior chamber lens or in case of a faking intraocular lens? 
uh, and do you have any advantage? Yes, you may do that, especially if you want to have a very good uh, um, capsulotomy. Uh, sometimes your maneuver in the anterior chamber can uh, kind of injure the uh, uh, anterior surface of the capsule. So doing this would be quite interesting. However, you have to cheat because the software of the femto laser doesn't differentiate between the fakie IOL and the anterior surface of the lens. Yeah, luckily you can actually tell the uh, program where is the lens and where is the uh, uh, cataract, and in this way you can do that. Here we have a case uh, of a lens which is called the Cachet lens. It was a, oops, what is that? Can you start again? And now? Can you take over and open it again? Okay. Let's just go over here. Oh, wait a second. Here we go. Okay, I'm not touching it. So you see here, we have the rexis already behind the lens, and this is a so-called cachet lens. It's also a fake IOL, which was quite popular. It's a hydrophobic acrylic, so uh, we have to cut it. We don't need to cut it 100%, just that it can be kind of folded out like this, and then we can take it out through a three millimeter uh, incision and then actually we can do the FACO as a normal FACO and put a lens in. I don't want to spend too much time on this. The only interesting thing here, this is a so-called zero FACO handpiece. This is, there's no FACO, it's just an uh, aspiration handpiece with a, with a bigger opening. And uh, in combination with the uh, femtosecond laser, you can actually aspirate uh, in a very nice fashion, almost like a FACO, the, the whole lens without using any kind of uh, ultrasound. So this is purely zero FACO uh, cataract surgery here. Let's go further. It becomes tricky if you have like a uh, lens which is fixated in the iris. Like this is an Artiflex lens. Uh, we already did a femtosecond laser capsulotomy and fragmentation. And now we have to <coughs> de-enclavate this lens and you need the specific uh, instruments for this, like you see here. But it's quite, quite easy actually to do. You hold the haptics, and with a spatula, you go through paracentesis and de enclavate the lens. But you need to have this specific forceps because you have to hold the haptics in order to have a firm grip. And, but it can be, be done quite easy. And as the lens is pretty soft, you don't really need to enlarge much. This uh, incision here is like three millimeter, uh, and we just go in with a strong um, forceps, grab the lens, and with a little bit of counter pressure here, I take the spatula and the, the, we can take it out. And then we can just proceed with, with the cataract surgery. There's nothing special about that. Okay, let's go on. So let's move now to the posterior segment. Sometimes you have the situation where not only the lens is decentered, but the whole capsular bag with some summerings ring, and sometimes, especially if you have pseudo exfoliation syndrome, there's even a capsular tension ring in it, and it's kind of just hanging on the, on the vitreous. Um, and then you have to think about, do I do an anterior approach, a posterior approach, or both? And how do I implant uh, the other eye, the other lens uh, in this eye? So what I usually do is I take a trocar to have an approach from behind. And even if I just use it at the beginning to have a counter pressure and make sure that the whole segment is not dropping down, it will help me to move the whole segment into the anterior chamber. Once I have the whole thing, including capsular bag and summering string in the anterior chamber, it's much easier to take it out without any problems. Here, uh, I actually did a um, clear cornea incision of like five millimeter in order to get this out because this is a PMMA uh, intraocular lens. 
and um, try to move, take it out here, but I, I then take a forceps because it's a little bit too big to just slide it out with the spatula, but here with the Doden uh, uh, forceps, you can take out everything. And then, uh, because I will put a retro pupillary fixated uh, iris fixated lens in the eye, I do a thorough uh, vitrectomy. You don't need a second uh, trocar, you can just uh, go through the paracentesis with the irrigation and, and do the vitrectomy from behind, from pars plana. In this case, make sure that there's nothing left behind. Then we put the artisan lens first in the anterior chamber and we assign it from three to nine, like here. And then we will fixate it behind the iris, not onto the iris, behind the iris, which has become a routine. It's much, much faster than transclerar fixation. This is unedited, it takes just a minute to put the lens in. So you put it under the iris, you lift it up, and then you can easily see how to enclavate it from this part. And you do the same on the other side. As you can see here, take it in, take it down, lift it up, and just put it in with a small spatula, very easy. And then the whole thing is more or less done. In Germany, we have experience for more than 15 years with the retropopulary fixation. It really is a very elegant method. Here I close the, the wound and then take off the, um, the trocar and the whole thing is actually done in, in a fairly small amount of time. And with this, surgery is more or less finished. Sometimes you have the situation where you cannot really see what's going on. Like here we have a trifocal intraocular lens, which is obviously decentered, and uh, part of the lens is inside the capsular bag, part is outside, and the patient suffers from a lot of problems uh, because of the decentration of the lens and the fibrosis of the capsule. And uh, sometimes you have to decide, do I have to take the lens out or can I kind of repair it? And you sometimes only see that during surgery. So in this case, it was quite difficult actually to see uh, uh, is the lens in the bag or out of the bag and what, are, what is fibrosing with what? First you of course, put uh, some viscoelastic in it, and uh, I, I like to use a cohesive viscoelastic like Helon or Helon GV to do that. And you can see here that apparently the subtic here is, is, is out, and the rest of the lens is somewhat in. So it's a very strange uh, situation. First of all, I try to kind of loosen the adherences here to make sure that I can move the lens. And there's kind of second layer also. Some lens epithelial cells have, have grown over the lens uh, uh, again. So you have to be very careful because you want to preserve the capsular bag for uh, another implant or if possible even for uh, repositioning of the lens. But there is some adhesion there, but slowly you can, can loosen it. And on the other side it's similar, slowly careful we get through it. So this looks much better now. Now we get an idea what's just going on here. So we see that the lens can be, can be moved and that we can separate anterior and posterior lens capsule. There's still some adhesion here which we carefully and with a, with a blunt uh, uh, spatula try to get off and then we use a lot of viscoelastic behind the lens to expand the posterior part of the capsule. And now you can see that we have to, we can push the lens back in the capsular bag, like here. Now we are back in business. Now we can centrate the lens. And in order to make sure it will not descend, we just put it 90 degrees away from its initial situation. And now it looks much better. We didn't need to explant the lens and we could handle the situation. The patient was very happy. I then also used the vitrectomy to cut out some of the fibrosis here, make a larger opening and then everything was fine. 
But sometimes there's also the problem that you have to remove, and not only because the lens is not in the capsular bag, especially in high myopic patients, these plate haptics are sometimes too small for the capsular bag. Here this patient got a trifocal toric intraocular lens, and it was completely decentered, as you can see here already on the picture. And if you look here in the video, the moment I go in with the irrigation, you can see that the lens is jumping back and forth in the capsular bag. You see here, you see, it's really, the capsular bag is way too big uh, for, this, for this lens. And this is not a really high myopic uh, patient, it was like minus six or minus eight, but with a like almost 30 millimeter length of uh, the uh, axial lens. So in this case, you have to remove the lens. And uh, what is always okay in this case is to put a classical C-loop, uh, 13 millimeter overall diameter lens in, in the capsular bag. And this is what we did here. We first removed the lens and the lens, this hydrophilic lens is very soft. You can actually grab it through the incision and take it out. It doesn't really look that small, if you look at it, this here, but it still, it was obviously too small. And then a classical technus uh, bifocal, multifocal toric lens was implanted in this patient. And uh, at the end, it was very happy about it uh, with, this, with this lens, so it was okay. But as I said here, we had to, the reason for explantation was here, a too small, undersized uh, intraocular lens. And now we just put the lens in place with the torus, toricity in the right correction. So these are just a few case samples of an everyday situation, patient coming in and the more uh, uh, ophthalmology advance, a lot of these uh, fake IULs that have been implanted 15 years ago or 20 years ago now come, uh, come to us. Now these patients are 60, 70, 80, and uh, they have a cataract, they have some compromised endothelium, so we have to have strategies uh, how to, to get, get along with that. And also these cases that we put lenses in quite a while ago, and now the zonules have dissolved and the zomerings ring has built up. These are the challenges uh, that, that come nowadays in our offices and our practices, and there are intelligent ways to handle that. And um, yeah, that's just the thing I wanna share with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Alfred, for this uh, uh, wonderful uh, opening of uh, a few case uh, samples of uh, lens explantation. In the Indian scenario, uh, we actually, you know, the PMMA lenses are better taken out uh, through the sclerocorneal uh, flap valve incision, the SICS that we are familiar with. That's the Indian modification of it. And of course, the IOL scaffold is doing a lot uh, when we explant lenses. So basically, uh, when we explant lenses, we actually implant the previous lens, uh, the lens to be implanted, and then bisect uh, the lens. Some of the surgeons are do also practicing that. So, uh, yeah. we, we usually uh, also look at the uh, astigmatic situation. So in these cases I showed, I used the clear cornea approach because I, uh, I wanted to manipulate the astigmatism. And uh, uh, if this would be not the case, I would also use a scleral approach to uh, get the lenses out. So these were some specific cases here. Right, right. And uh, thank you very much for these lovely presentations. Thank you. So, yeah. Yeah, greetings from uh, Dishai Hospitals, and uh, this is our course. Uh, so, uh, at the beginning, well, what's happening? Okay, fine. So, uh, the wow factor of phaco emulsification actually sets in very early, maybe on the first post operative day. And that is why we all need to convert from SICS to FACO. And that's what we'll be doing in the next one hour, 15 minutes. 
And uh, before I go there, I call the panelists uh, on the dais, Dr. Manoj Ghosh uh, from Dishai Hospitals, Dr. Dipanjan Pal, Dr. Sanjeev Banerjee, and Dr. Minmoy Das. So they will be uh, with me through the course. And uh, well, uh, it's high time that we take this drive because we were fairly comfortable and we're giving good, excellent results with SICS. But the cataracts are getting softer. The machines are getting better, and we have uh, affordable Indian equipment and Indian lenses, foldable lenses, hydrophobic lenses. Uh, so all this converge into one direction that we should concentrate on giving this wow factor to our patients. And of course, our patients are coming at an earlier age, and we are uh, earlier stage of cataract, and we are more into cataract refractive surgery. So uh, we need to do that. So what we need is definitely uh, access to a good microscope, because if we can't see, we can't do. And uh, a predictable FACO machine, because you know, in the beginning, you don't know whether it's your problem or the machine's problem. So please get a, get a hand to a reasonably good FACO machine. I have no financial interest, but these are good FACO machines. And the third one is you must have a regular OT facility, at least two or three cases uh, twice or thrice a week, because otherwise things learned in the previous theater is forgotten. And uh, so, I mean, when you see that big box FACO machine, uh, don't be uh, too scared because it's just an irrigation aspiration Simco machine which has emulsification power at its tip. That's what it is. Nothing beyond that. And it's gravity fed, so the irrigation is a passive process and the uh, irrigation depends upon the bottle height. The higher the bottle height. And then we have most of the newer machines will have these cassettes which has uh, a disposable sensor, a vacuum sensor, and which connects to an irrigation and aspiration tubing down to the FACO probe, which ho houses the piezoelectric crystals. And the blue one is the electrical thing, which sends uh, signals to the um, <coughs> piezoelectric crystals for the ultrasound to operate. Now, the heart of the machine is this uh, motor, which is a peristalting pinching motor. The slower the uh, aspiration flow rate is set, slower the motor moves. Faster it is set, the faster the motor moves. So uh, the fa this is all guided by the FACO paddle, which is activated uh, in foot position one. You have the irrigation on, in two, the irrigation and aspiration, and in three, uh, the irrigation aspiration and FACO is activated. So irrigation, as I told you, is a continuous process uh, and is activated in all the three stages of the foot paddle. And it depends upon the bottle height, the opening uh, size in the you know, sleeve, the number of openings in the sleeve. If you want to e increase the irrigation, you can have another small uh, port in the, there are two ports, you can have a third port. And of course it's specific for the machine because the bore of the tubing also decides the irrigation. So irrigation compensates the leakage and the aspiration, whatever you're aspirating, and the wound has to leak because you know that cools the, uh, uh, the wound from the effect of the ultrasound. Uh, and uh, if there's more irrigation, you see that the chamber deepens, but uh, you know, when there's, uh, when uh, nothing is happening, what happens is in, no fluid also comes in because it's a watertight situation. So uh, depending upon the bottle height, we have some intraocular pressure, and beyond that, the irrigation stops, and uh, so that's how it functions. Now the aspiration part is activated in foot position two, and it is, as I told you, the motor speed. So, uh, and it is measured in cc per minute. So more we raise the flow, uh, more things come to the tip. So flow, aspiration as we raise, more things uh, come to the tip and things happen faster. 
So, you know, if we set the higher flow rate for the same vacuum, the vacuum rise time will increase because the vacuum will rise suddenly. Now for the vacuum, which is for peristaltic machines, which I would recommend all of you to use, once the tip is occluded by a fragment, the vacuum develops. So what happens that the tubings collapse and the tip is totally occluded, so there is no fluid coming at the tip. And the vacuum is measured by that sensor, vacuum sensor, by the collapse of that vacuum sensor. So once it goes to the preset, maybe we've set at 200 or 300, when it collapses to that, the motor stops. So no more uh, collapse happens. And the va vacuum, as you know, is measured in millimeter of mercury. Vacuum gives the holding power of the lens. I mean, that we hold a nucleus or a fragment, it gives us that. And emulsification, well, uh, energy is de delivered in foot position three. So as energy is delivered, the occlusion is broken and the vacuum comes down. So the tubings get a fluid comes in and the tubing swell. The sensor activates the motor because, again, the collapse of the sensor is gone and the aspiration flow starts all over again. So this is a cycle, emulsification, occlusion, emulsification, vacuum break, then the moment vacuum break, the motor gets activated, aspiration starts, and the fragment is again re-engaged. So this keeps on happening. So the ease and um, this uh, compliance of the tubing is the ease at which these uh, tubings collapse. And in the newer machines, you know, we have lesser compliant machines because if the tubes have collapsed, we have set high vacuum, and suddenly they swell up, so they'll take in a lot of fluid from the eye, and that is what causes the surge. So in newer machines, the compliance is less, the torque of the motor is high, and uh, the vacuum sensors are disposable, so, you know, they behave as they should, because the vacuum sensor, because, you know, you repeatedly happening, every time you are emulsifying, the vacuum sensors are going, the cycle that I said. So, the tin plates may get a little, uh, may give a wrong reading. So that's where, you know, you don't get what you set. And uh, those things can, and you raise the vacuum. So in that case, you can get surge. But newer machines, that's the advantage. You don't get surge. <coughs> now, uh, I mean, if uh, um, there is a lot of vacuum, a lot of flow rate, and suddenly there's an occlusion break, so it takes in a lot of fluid, and that's where you can have a surge. So little about the energy that, you know, how does the energy modify? It in modifies by uh, uh, re uh, increasing the stroke length. The stroke length is altered. That is how the power is altered. And uh, torsional is a better equipment because of few things, if you concentrate, that, you know, it moves from side to side. So what happens is it doesn't repel. So you need less vacuum settings for a harder cataract in torsional energy rather than in longitudinal energy. And similarly, because it's moving side to side, when it's moving this side, it's emulsifying, but when it's moving the other side, it's actually bringing the phaco tip, thereby minimizing aspiration. So you can lower both vacuum and aspiration if you're using torsional. So that way it's a softer and safer energy. And uh, the other advantage is like in the longitudinal, it's moving in the wound all the time in the incision. Like this is the incision, the tip is always moving like this. But if it is moving side to side, only uh, one third of it is reflected in the incision. So the chances of wound burns are less. So let me uh, run you through a few examples. Concentrate on the right side parameters. Maybe just intentionally kept the, uh, uh, you know, the probe slightly away, and we are ra raising the aspiration flow. See, we are raising the aspiration flow. When it goes to a, then you get the piece to come. So that is to explain how flow happens. 
this you see, you know, uh, the, there's energy, and then you see that the vacuum has built up to 350, and it gives you that hold to chop. So that's vacuum. And when emulsification, you just follow the right-hand parameters, and you will see that, you know, the aspiration is coming, going, vacuum is coming, going. So that's how the cycle that I said keep on happening. And uh, this one is to so show chatter when you're using less vacuum and more power. See, power on the right, uh, left hand side, uh, you will see how the fragments chatter. So, you know, there has to be a balance. So, you know, uh, uh, you cannot use less energy for a harder cataract or more energy. For, uh, and if you're ha using more energy, it has to be balanced. Now, see, if you use more power, uh, vacuum and flow, as in this case, this is a cadaveric eye. So you see, there you get the PCR because the moment the occlusion is broken, the vacuum rises, uh, uh, so the tubing swell because it was set at a very high vacuum and because the aspiration flow is very high, so the tubing suddenly uh, uh, draw in a lot of fluid because it suddenly enlarges and that's how we get a PCR. So that's Manoj, you know, after every surgery, he enjoy, uh, after every surgical session, he enjoys a uh, apple. So that's as simple as that. You need to hold the apple. You need to uh, <coughs> chop it and then emulsify it and enjoy it. So that's as simple as that. So the second thing that I would try and impress that wet labs are extremely important. I mean, it's very easily done. The goat's eye, freely available in the market. Take a thermocool box, fix it. This is the biggest, easiest simulation that you can have in our Indian context. Fix it properly, and this is what we have prepared. Now, this is what we do. You have done SICS in the morning, or maybe a few days back. You can keep them in those nucleuses in formalin. Now you do about... Professor Afra, this is the way we do our scleral tunnels and uh, the manual small incision, which is a popular brand of cataract surgery here. So <clears throat> this is the scleral tunnel, and, and all this is for a purpose. I'll tell you when. I'll tell you why. And, <coughs> you know, many of uh, us uh, say that, you know, you practice the rexes over a uh, uh, boiled potato or, you know, the cigarette wrappers, uh, the uh, cellophane paper of a cigarette wrapper, but I think this gives you the best feel, the best feel of a rexis. Now here we are doing an intentionally small rexis. The purpose of it will be evident because what we are going is to pre prepare, what we are doing now is preparing a exact simulation and do a lot of them, you know, five, ten every day before you have started training. So. Now you, you get the first hand feel of the machine, you're sculpting. So you're just pushing the pressure on the paddle slowly and sculpting a soft nucleus. So you're making a bowl, and again, this bowl is to accommodate your SICS nucleus. We've done the tunnel and the sclerocorneal valve just to introduce the nucleus of the what we have taken out through SICS. This is not available to the Western world because in the Western world they don't do ECC, neither they do uh, uh, SICS. So they, a total nucleus, human nucleus is not available, but we do have it because we do a lot of SICS. And you do it, so uh, I mean that's what you do. You do the reverse, dial the nucleus in. So into that bowl that you have created, and this is a wonderful simulation. Now go ahead, do your trench, do your crack, do your chop. You want to uh, switch on to direct chop from stop and chop. Anything that you would like to um, uh, do, you can have this wonderful model to do, uh, carry on. So, you know, uh, practice all the steps in the perfect manner. And uh, I tell you, this is the best simulation and uh, we had one uh, uh, fellow from 
uh, Germany, uh, he only gave injections he, uh, and uh, he was into medical retina. His first surgical exposure for this was in uh, our hospital and he did a lot of wet labs. He did 20 cases under supervision uh, in the human eye, went back and started his practice as a cataract surgeon in Stuttgart. So, so you can practice all of them and be sure, you know, if you've done it in the goat's eye, you will definitely do it in the human eye. Now, let me take you through <coughs> the preliminaries of uh, the steps of learning. Initially, you know, do all cases, tr do SICS, I mean, plan SICS in mind because probably you'll be giving a PMMA rigid lens, but do try your machine at every time when you're confident with your wet labs. So, and stain every rexis in your initial cases because in phaco emulsification, it becomes very mandatory to see the rexis all the time during the procedure. So, uh, the rexis, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the ca capsules being stained and the... So, few things to remember is the direction of the two ports that you've made. You know, one must come into the subincisional cortex and your left hand port should go towards the five o'clock because that is with which you are going to guide the nucleus and chop the nucleus. So these directions are important. And because we are right-handed persons and because of the carrying angle, so you know, we need to be seated comfortably, I think the top line, seated comfortably in the microscope, not being crouched, not being, uh, you know, too, because initially we are a little tense. Don't go too close because uh, your hands get uh, crowded uh, in the uh, field of work, sit properly in the microscope. And of course, you know, because of our right hand rule, this uh, incision of the main phaco incision must be, you know, from maybe 12, th uh, 11.30 to somewhere around 5.30. So that's the direction because that's how we are comfortable running the phaco probe. And of course, these two would be two clock hours away from each other because that doesn't crowd our, our both hands together, right? And if we don't do that, suppose, you know, we are sitting here and we've given an incision here. Now when we are doing the uh, phaco uh, trenching like this, this part of the incision uh, of the phaco probe is touching my incision more. So, you know, there you can actually damage the incision and even cause a wound burn. <coughs> so, rexis is a fairly simple step which all of us know. And, uh, you know, we need to uh, turn the rexis on and uh, catch uh, from near the rexis. What is important about the rexis is you need to refill whenever the chamber goes away. And there are a few tips, like when in SICS we know when we lift, uh, the incision closes. So, you know, same is with the posterior lip. So when you are using the needle, rest it on the upper lip of the incision. That is how you can uh, uh, retain the viscoelastic that we work with, that is, uh, 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 we don't get heavy viscoelastics. So, that's how you can retain them and also pull up the forceps. If you are in apprehension, press the forceps down, you actually lose the viscoelastic and that's how you can manage a good rexis. Here we need to do a big rexis because initially don't try to have, and we are, because of SICS, we are all used to do big rexis. So, you know, because uh, it, you, it is the incision on the lens and uh, FACO is an endocapsular procedure. So if you have a better, a bigger rexis, you're much safer off. Now, uh, when, uh, before that, now we have a fully um, packed uh, chamber of viscoelastic, so now we need to press the posterior lip to debulk it to create some space for hydrodissection. And then gently go, do multiple times, and after each uh, fluid that you've uh, injected, go and lift the anterior capsule and inject because then you get a cortical cleavage hydrodissection and uh, 
this is one step you can practice as much because you do it in SICS and just do it with the left hand because you know now in phaco emulsification your left hand chopper use is going to become more so you know you need to do this and you must use equal forces on both sides otherwise we track the we uh, may, uh, create un, un, undue pressure on the zonules and uh, so that's how we rotate the nucleus and do it with the left hand as many times as you want so you know that's a good practicing exercise and uh, so I skip this and uh, there'll be there are many rules to trenching my subsequent speakers will come and tell you and of course you know there are many rules to breaking the nucleus also because uh, once you have trenched properly see the red glow you must start from the periphery and then proceed to the center because the center probably the plate will be slightly harder it's like tearing the paper you try to tear it from the center it doesn't work that way and you can rotate it and go from the other end to have a complete crack now in the stop and chop is the uh, technique that we recommend I mean just go in align because you're using a 30 degree tip align the phaco uh, divided uh, fragment align it properly go to the middle don't shy away don't be superficial go to the middle of the nucleus have a small burst of energy come back to two don't come back to one you know suddenly the beginners come back to one but with one only irrigation is active so that's what happens so you lose the grip and uh, so that's how it happens you go there go to the middle give a little energy see the right stop the vacuum has developed see how you know you've held it properly now chopper you know you have so many fancy choppers and uh, essentially it's just to suit the surgeon style even and Sinsky can do what it actually does is you know you need to hold the nucleus properly now if you are com un uncomfortable at any stage so and you have to give the PMMA lens because I told you practice in every case so you can just switch over the facts for switching over is you must fill that anterior chamber with visco completely and tightly before you do this tunneling uh, otherwise it's very difficult to get a good tunnel and uh, you can complete and finish the procedure so uh, this is how the next uh, steps we take you through uh, trenching and uh, cracking and I invite Dr. Sanjeev Banerjee to carry you through this. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you Dr. Devasish Bhattacharya for inviting and uh, allowing me in this, in this course. My topic is uh, trenching and cracking. Because of angulation, 45 degree tips uh, does more sculpting, but uh, trenching is uh, less. And 15 degree tip is almost uh, circular in configuration, which gives more occlusion than trenching. And zero degree tips gives occlusion only. And 30 degree tip is ideal for trenching. During trenching, mild to moderate aspiration flow rate is uh, sufficient as there is no followability or occlusion is required and the vacuum is my moderate vacuum is required because we only need to remove the trench material during trenching power setting depends on the hardness of the nucleus harder the nucleus more preset energy to be used and in softer cataract softer energy like micropulse or torsional can be used uh, during uh, trenching 1 to 1.5 millimeter of uh, tip should be exposed from the sleep trenching should start just in front of the rexis margin at 12 o'clock and stops just uh, short of uh, rexis margin at 6 o'clock it should not cross the rexis on either side in uh, harder uh, cataract 
trenching should be wide and long and in more energy should be used during uh, uh, trenching in harder cataract. In softer cataract, uh, less energy should be used and the tunnel should be short and narrow. The angle of attack means the angle between the anterior surface of the lens and the angle uh, FECO needle and it should be 45 degree. Otherwise, uh, we may superficially chip the nucleus and injure the rexis. One third of the tip should be buried in the nucleus to get perfect trenching. If we bury the tip too much in the nucleus, the tip does not trench but pushes the nucleus to the periphery and the same thing happens if we use less energy or be shy on the paddle. The nucleus is uh, thicker in the center. So while trenching, uh, more amount of tissue should be trenched in the center and while coming back, no energy should be wasted and more energy to be used during trenching in the center of the nucleus. Every time the refocus of the microscope is essential for uh, seeing the uh, posterior aspect of the nucleus very clearly. They remove uh, small chips carefully during deep trenching, otherwise we may blow a hole in the periphery. While rotating the nucleus, if we rotate from the center of the trench, we get a short fulcrum. So there is a difficulty in, in uh, rotating. But if we rotate from the periphery, if we push from the periphery of the tunnel, we get bigger fulcrum and there will be a better rotation. So well, when one side of the uh, uh, nucleus is strange and then the nucleus is rotated 180 degree to get uh, scalp from the upper part of the trench. We can uh, counterbalance the force of trenching by fixing the nucleus with a Sinsky hook. Now coming to cracking. Uh, we need to place the two instrument at the deeper part of the uh, trench and apply equal force on either instrument in the depth of the tunnel. If we apply more force at one, one instrument, there will be traction on the opposite zonule. Now, while cracking, the, if we place the instrument at the superficial part of the trench, it will be very difficult to get it cracked. When uh, cracking should be initiated from the periphery of the uh, train tunnel, and the, then it is, uh, if it is incomplete, we need to rotate 180 degree and complete the cracking from other part of the trench. The center is very hard, so it is very difficult to, uh, to crack from the center. Moreover, we do not get a good fulcrum. Now, uh, this video demonstrates how to do right trenching and cracking. The trenching is started from the 12 o'clock, just in front of the 12 block at the axis margin, and uh, stops just in front of the axis margin at the 6 o'clock. And one third of the FACO needle tip should be engaged during trenching. And the width of the tunnel should be one and a half width of the FECO needle. When one side is completed, the nucleus is rotated 180 degree and do the same thing uh, for the trenching in the other side. Then during drip tension, we need to refocus microscopic to see clearly. And sometimes we need to uh, repeat this step to get the desired depth of the tunnel. And when the desired depth is reached, place two instrument at the periphery and cracking initiated. And if it is incomplete, rotate the nucleus 180 degree 
and trenching is uh, cracking is completed from the other side. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjeev. I find some uh, doctors clicking uh, slide uh, visuals. You need not do that because uh, this entire course is on YouTube. You can go in, it's got a full commentary. Just type my name, converting from SICS to FACO, you get the whole course. So go through it at your leisure, anytime and every time you want to. Now, in the thing that uh, Sanjeev mentioned, I mean, often you would see that, you know, the surgeons in stop and chop would be using the uh, probe and uh, the left hand instrument. But for beginners, we would always recommend take out the probe. The visualization becomes so much better. You know, sometimes you have done a little uh, erroneous sculpting and, uh, you know, it's, things have become hazy. So what you do is uh, just take out your probe and uh, do a little IA and you'll see everything clearly again and then go ahead again. Sometimes we see that the beginners miss the direction. So you can mark the lower pole where you want the trench to be go. So you can take your probe along that direction. Regarding this dive in and climb down the hill and climb up the hill because the nucleus is thickest in the center. So you dive, you go down the hill and then go up. That's how you distribute the energy more to the deepest part of the nucleus. Yes, Minmoy, carry on. Good morning, everyone. Uh, for the beginners, choosing the ideal case for FECO training is very important. And one should keep in mind that the right eye should be preferred to avoid the nose barrier. A grade three nuclear sclerosis is ideal because too hard or too soft cataract is very difficult to deal with for the beginner. The pupil should be well dilated so that the capsular doing capsular exercise is easier and the visualization of the total cataract is very essential for them. Cornea should be clear and deep-seated eyes should be avoided. Adequate eyelid exposure is needed. AC depth should be more than 2.5 millimeter but less than 3 millimeter because in hypermetropic cases there is in shallow AC it is difficult to work with because there is very little space between the endothelium and capsule. And in deep chambers like myopic eyes, it is also difficult to work with because the instrument, uh, because the maneuverability of the instrument is very difficult. And chamber fluctuations is much more occur in the myopic eyes. And red glow must be good in these cases and second eye is preferred. Now come, coming uh, to incision, incision is the first step towards the successful phaco emulsification. Uh, incision should be a clear corneal because if it includes the conjunctiva, then uh, th there is conjunctival ballooning occurs and if the 360 ballooning occurs, uh, 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 then uh, it becomes a well full of water and the cornea in, in the um, uh, in bottom of that well. So the visualization is difficult. And it should be of square geometry because square geometric shape of the incision withstands greater external pressure, improves wound integrity, resists leaking, and thus avoids endophthalmitis. For the beginner, the incision should be, uh, uh, the incision may be superior or temporal, but the, for beginner, superior is preferred because whatever surgery he has done previously is he's done through the head end. So the superior incision will be familiar for him. This video demonstrates how to make a single plane incision. You just enter into the AC directly with a 2.8 keratom. Now this video demonstrates a two plane incision. First make a groove with a 15 number BP blade and uh, uh, then you just uh, advanced uh, with the keratom to entry into the AC. This is a trip and blue stained keratom just to demonstrate the square shaped incision, square shaped incision. Now coming to three planar incision, first make a groove in the limbus with a 15 number BP blade, 
then make a clear corneal tunnel um, uh, uh, by lamellar dissection with the crescent knife and then advanced advance the 3.2 keratome into anterior chamber Uh, during side port incision, you have to take you have to take in uh, you have to keep in mind that the dull edge of the side port should be towards the six o'clock, and the tip of the side port blade should be towards the opposite chamber, entry chamber angle. The side port incision should be of a funnel configuration, and the left side side port should be two clock hour uh, two clock hours away from the main incision, because it increases the maneuverability, minimizes the leak, and minimizes the stria during the operation. If the left side uh, left side port is more than two clock hours from the main port, the chopper motion becomes more of a sweep, and if it is less than two clock hours, then hands becomes crowded. After completion of cataract surgery, stromal hydration should be needed to seal the entry chamber water tight. But during stromal hydration, you should be care, uh, taken care so that there is, should not be any desmet detachment, and always assess firmness and wound tightness at the end. A snugly fit FACO probe and incision gives a stable entry chamber. But if a, a tight incision pinches the slip and reduces the flow, resulting in shallow and unstable chamber. And in case of tight incision, the ultrasound tip touches the incision and the heat is transferred directly to the incision, resulting in wound burn. Now carefully see, the, see this case. This is a hard, hard nucleus and uh, uh, you could see the CD ratio and you could see the tightness of the incision. So after some time, you could see the white, whitish change of the upper leaf of the incision, which indicates that wound burn is happening. Now the incision becomes more uh, whitish. Now it's chalky white, and these incisions usually give a fish mouth appearance. So you could see after taking out the uh, FICO probe, you could see that there is a fish mouth appearance. So whenever it happens, you must go for suture the incision or um, make a fresh incision to complete the FICO. So the commonest cause is tight wound, wound burn. The commonest cause of wound burn is tight wound. Always ensure fluid flow around the tip. Remove viscoelastics adequately before applying energy because maximum burn occurs during the tip occlusion and fragment removal, which is a no-flow state. So put a suture or minimize the wound margin, what I have already told. Now coming to a four-quadrant technique. Four-quadrant technique is a very simple, classical, and safe technique. Every beginner should learn the technique um, before going for a, a stop and chop or direct chopping technique. So here, uh, uh, this video demonstrates a full case of four quadrant technique. So first, we are making incisions. It's a two pl biplanar incision, then putting the viscoelastics to maintain the entry chamber. And now we are making the side ports. So whatever the knowledge we have gained till now from the, this course, we are applying the, those knowledge uh, during the operation, um, during this four quadrant technique. So capsulorexis is initiated with the capsulorexis forceps. The capsulorexis should be around five to six millimeter in diameter. Now the capsule completed. Now we are doing the uh, hydro dissection. After hydro dissection, always tap the nucleus so that the trapped fluid behind the nucleus should be should come out. And now we are rotating the nucleus by two blunt instruments. And now the chopping started from the center to the periphery. Now I, uh, rotating the nucleus 180 degree and trying to complete the trench. Depth should be like that so that we can see the fundal glow. We can just see the fundal glow through the incision. Whenever you see the fundal go, it means your depth is quite good. Now rotating the nucleus 90 degree and making another trench. And now rotate 180 degree 
and now we are completing the trench and now with the help of two blunt instruments placed deep and periphery the crack initiated and after rotation of 180 degree we could uh, we can divide the nucleus totally the, you, you can see that the posterior plate is divided is separated totally now the nucleus is divided into three parts and now it is divided into four parts and you, you, you could see that every part is separated from others now we started the phacoemulsification phacoemulsification so the, uh, as there is a little space in the bag, so we, we have to take out the first part of the nucleus uh, in the pupillary plane and started phacoemulsification. Always use the um, left, si left side, uh, always use a chopper uh, in your left hand and try to fit the nucleus into the phaco probe. Uh, you, you should take care that chattering should not occur in this stage because if the part of the nucleus is hard, that can damage the endothelium during chattering. So we are almost completed the phacoemulsification of the first quadrant. And now second quadrant is uh, uh, phacoemulsified at the pupillary plane or just below the pupillary plane it is in the similar way as, as it was in the, uh, it, it was as usual, it's like the first um, uh, fragment. And in this way, you can do the phacoemulsification very easily. And after second, uh, after second quadrant, then third quadrant, during the last quadrant, you have to be keep in mind that there is no support of the posterior capsule so always there is a chance that the posterior capsule can come into your phaco probe. So during the last fragment, you have to be very careful that your anterior chamber should uh, be maintained very properly. And if the if sometimes the if the part of the nucleus is very it's, it's a very hard nucleus, uh, then chattering uh, can cause the posterior capsule damage in this in that stage because the posterior capsule there is no support for the posterior capsule at this moment. And after that, you, you can take out the epinucleus in the epinuclear yeah, mode uh, very easily. Brindma, can you Thank summarize? You. Okay, sir. Thank you. Yeah, okay. I mean, it was very well said by Mrinmoy about the, uh, choosing the ideal case and then having the uh, incision. Well, the main part is to climb on the cornea because, you know, the cornea, uh, we all do SICS incisions. So, you know, you need to climb in the cornea and then dip. Because, you know, if you have a leaky incision, then again you are in trouble because, you know, the chamber will be shallow all the time and you can't work. If it is a tight incision, you're going to have a wound burn. You can have a wound burn. But generally, you know, the micropulse or the torsional energies are much forgiving, especially the torsional. And uh, even when you are working with harder nucleus, maybe, use the uh, micropulse because in that case you know there is uh, intermittent release of energy so if you are using straight uh, longitudinal power that is where you saw one case where you get wound burns another thing is you know to enlarge the efficiency of your phaco energy i mean the distance of the sleeve from the tip how much of the tip is exposed the more you expose the tip, you can get more energy. More energy means more effective ultrasound dis disruption. So that's it. Uh, uh, Dipanjan, yes. Good, good, good morning again. Uh, after a successful trenching and four quadrant technique, we come to the next day that is stop and chop technique, which is a combination of trenching, cracking, and then stop and then chop. So coming to the parameters from, for FACO settings, for trenching, we have to have a higher power. It could be linear, continuous, up to 80% can be used with a less flow and less vacuum. 
for impaling the nucleus, which is the essential part of the phaco chop. There, there ha uh, we can either use burst or continuous or micropulse mode with a higher flow and higher vacuum. And <clears throat> for emulsification, either micropulse or torsional with a higher flow and higher vacuum. So for impaling, we need to know that proper alignment of the phaco probe along with the part to be impelled is very essential. So we can see that this portion of the phaco tip is not properly occluded and it is difficult to get a proper chop. And the moment we align the nucleus along with the bevel of the tip and it is properly aligned, so this portion of the phaco tip is now properly aligned and occluded and we can actually initiate the chop. Another part is if the probe is superficial, the hold is weak and there is always a chance it can slip and injure your rexis which can extend into a PC rent. So coming to a video and stop and chop, we start with the usual staining of the nuclei, vis visco and then a single planar incision. starting the rexis with the cystitome and try to make it with a medium size around 5.5 millimeter. Deepen the chamber with viscoelastic and we mark the limbus just to have a proper place where our trench should be so that we can get an equal division of nuclei. We start the trenching, finish the trenching after rotating the nuclei 180 degree. We get a crack. And then now we will ch start chopping. We remember two things very important. The hold has to be good. And just by rotating the phaco probe, we ensure that we actually have hold it properly before chopping. So, what essentially we do is, when we use energy to impale, we have to come back from position 3 to 2 of the foot paddle, but not to 1. Because the moment we come to 1, we actually can, we, we are using only irrigation, so we, we can lose the chamber. And again, if we, if we put too much power, we can actually break through the nuclei and put a punch hole in the posterior capsule. See how we are initiating chopping, we, the hold is perfect and we can initiate the chop. So while chopping, we actually deliver equal forces diagonally opposite. So the chopper, the phaco probe and the chopper to initiate and carry, carry forward the chop again. And if some, for some reason we cannot get a proper chop and the posterior pole is not separated, we can actually remove the probe. Dr. De De Dr. Bhattacharya was telling us earlier that the visibility is better and we can use two instruments like two Sinskis or one Sinski and one chopper to have a proper crack we'll need to ensure the separation is complete before going for the next job. So this is the next job. We hold it properly and get the job. For emulsification, there has to, the vacuum has to go up, aspiration flow rate has to go up, and we have to note that the cycle of vacuum hold energy aspiration flow rate during the whole process of emulsification and higher vacuum and, and higher flow is actually required for harder cataracts. So step by step we'll remove the, the nuclear parts. Depending on the hardness we can make four to eight or six <coughs> part of the nuclei.
be careful now when we are finishing and don't remove the phacoprobe suddenly because there is sudden loss of chamber which can injure your rexis and also your PC. So withdraw the chopper first and then the probe in foot position one so that the chamber is never lost. For a beginner it is always uh, better to start with an bimanual irrigation aspiration where the irrigation port and aspiration port are separately drawn into and during in, it, uh, this irrigation aspiration take the upper leaf of the cortex and, the, and strip in case the aspiration cannula is clogged rub the tip irrigation cannula to, to clear it and we can always switch hand to access the sub area or the opposite pole and we need to see that the IA doesn't get overlocked and the chamber is always well formed and this can be your first step from SICS to FACO because after SICS you can, we can always try and start with a bimanual irrigation aspiration and get conversed with it. So while we are doing FACO, we already know one step at least that is irrigation aspiration properly. So see how, be be manage, so how beautifully the chamber is well formed with one hand where the irrigation is continuous and now sometimes if it is difficult to get here the subpositional thing we can always switch hand and then do it properly. So uh, just, just to remember. Show the other video. You missed a video. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, previous. Oh, 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 I missed one video. <laughs> this is uh, just to show in a soft cataract another advantage and stop and chop. This is, oh, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, this is, oh. no, no, yeah, it's, letting, it's running, running. Just the rexus is finished. Uh, we are actually hydro delineating because this is a posterior polar cataract. Suspect. And after a trench, as we cannot Suspect. do chopping now, this is a uh, stop and chop technique comes really handy in these scenarios. We can just have a soft crack, only the nuclear part. And then we can take one half at a time without chopping. Here, uh, please observe, you know, that there's no chopping because it's so soft a cataract. Yes. So uh, actually, we you, did know, not you chop. can't chop. So you just can bring out, uh, this is one advantage of stop and chop, that you just have divided the two nucleus and if it's too soft, you can just uh, finish one half and then the second half. So that's what the surgeon is doing here. Keep the and irrigation on before taking out the phaco probe. Fill the chamber with visco. Visco dissecting the epinuclei, which is very helpful in situation of posterior polar cataract. Often and in epinuclear management, you know, you will yeah. require this. Slight mobilization of the epinuclei under visco coverage and taking the epinuclei out with the phaco probe using a high vacuum and aspiration fluoret. At all points of the phaco emulsification technique, we cannot lose the chamber at any point of time and that gives us the maximum benefit. See, we have always using and side port aspiration to keep the chamber formed 
and then again this bimanual technique comes very handy in posterior polar cases. Take the superficial strips and if required you can always switch hands. and finish up the case without having a rent in the posterior capsule. And then under irrigation you put the intraocular lens. So just to give a funny reminder that superficial hold doesn't impale or doesn't chop. If you want a proper chop or proper impalement of the probe, you have to hold the nuclei properly. Thank you. Yeah, now I invite uh, Manush Kush. Manush is our FACO instructor uh, for our training course, and uh, Manush will be dealing with the last topic, and that's uh, the direct chop. Good morning. Um, I think we have finished the trenching, cracking, stop and chop. Now they come in the little bit uh, higher technique as the FECO chop technique. So I will go a little bit uh, details into the FECO chop. What is chopping? It is a chopping is a procedure by dividing the ne lens nucleus into multiple fragments by taking the advantage of natural cleavage plane of the lens nucleus. Now what are the advantages of chopping? It reduced FECO power and time, and that can save a lot of ultrasound energy. And chopping uh, reduces the stress on the zonules and is less dependent on the red duplex. So what we can do in the vertical chop, do a central trenching. The central trenching reduces the lens thickness in the center part because we know the lens is uh, thickest at the center. So if you reduce the central thickness, that will be easy to do the chopping and cracking the central nucleus, which is difficult to crack. So once the central uh, nucleus has been trenched and debulked, we impel the FECO probe into the one side of the trench, put some energy, and that energy will will embed the FECO tip into the nucleus when the whole tip goes into the nucleus and preset vacuum will reach now 100 then preset to 400 once you go the vacuum reach to 400 once the preset vacuum is reached you will get an occlusion sound once you heard the occlusion sound start chopping from the periphery to the center and chopping is completed. Once the one side of the chopping is completed, rotate the nucleus into 180 degree and do the same procedure, impel the other side of the nucleus, put some energy, embed the FECO tip into the nucleus, go to the uh, preset vacuum 400. Once you heard the occlusion sound, do the chop. So now the whole nucleus is divided into two. Now you can do further chopping to make it more fragments, whatever you like, four, five, six, and then emulsify. Now coming to the instruments for chop, definitely we need an extra instrument, that is the chopper. A chopper can be two types, one is sharp, another is blunt. Sharp chopper, the characteristics should be of the sharp chopper, tip is, should be sharp, and length uh, is 0.5 to 1.5 millimeter more harder cut cataract you want to chop go for longer chopper means 1.5 to 1.75 maybe you can go to 2 millimeter also but softer cataract less, uh, lesser length of the chopper will be uh, required so for the beginning you use 0.75 to 1 as you will be more comfortable with the chopping go for a 
longer tip chopper. Angulation should be 90 to 100 degrees. Blunt chopper, the tip is blunt and length also is, uh, tip of the chopper length is 0.75 to 1.5 millimeter and the, there is a cutting edge inside the tip. As coming to the side port position, as already our previous speakers described, the position of the side port, important, uh, side port is very important. So it should be more than two and a half, more than two, uh, two clock hour. Ideally, it should be two and a half to three hour, three clock hour. So if you keep the side port position below, uh, below the uh, uh, two clock hour, you will get uh, not a good fulcrum and you will you will not be able to do the uh, chop. So you see, see the chop uh, side port incision is very closer to the incision and you fail to, instead of giving so much of pressure, we fail to chop the nucleus. But uh, once, we, uh, once we correct it and put it into the uh, three, three o'clock uh, position, three o'clock hour away, so we can easily crack the nucleus. Uh, coming to the vertical chopping, uh, why it is vertical chopping? Because the movement of the chopper is in the vertical plane. That's why it is called vertical chop. So first we hold the central part of the nucleus and uh, just to show how good it holds, so we, we uh, move the phaco teeth so that the whole nucleus is moving. That means we get a good grip. Once one side of the uh, nucleus is chopped, we rotate it to 180 degree and completed the other side in the same manner. So like this, you can chop as many fragments as you want. More you do the fragments, more will be easier to emulsify. Uh, debulking, this is a very important step. It reduces the thickness of the nucleus. It reduces the hardness. So and also it creates space for chopping. So uh, especially this is, uh, is uh, needed when you're dealing with a more harder cataracts. So I will keep this video. No, you have one minute. Carry on. So uh, uh, this is multi-level chopping. This multi-level chopping is uh, important, uh, especially in case of hard cataract, where the, uh, uh, the whole nucleus thickness is very hard and thick in the center part. So in one shot, you may not be able to chop uh, the full nucleus. So in multi-level chopping that as described by Dr. Bhasavada, you hold the nuclear at a, at a different plane and that's why in this way you can uh, divide the nucleus fully. So once first you hold superficially, uh, half crack the nucleus, then hold at the deeper plane and crack it. So you can show the, you can see this video. So we are holding repeatedly at the deeper plane and dividing the nucleus. So that's why we can uh, chop the nucleus in a dense cataract like this. So this multi-level chopping is required in case of uh, harder cataract. Uh, so horizontal chopping, uh, especially... Manoj, I think we have uh, uh, okay, okay, okay. exceeded our time. Okay. Uh, horizontal chopping is for soft cataracts, so uh, uh, we have stop and chop for that, and we, uh, I think beginners, we uh, strongly recommend that. So then again, it's that Manoj's uh, apple treat after a good uh, uh, cataract session. So thank you everybody for being in this course and uh, sorry friends, we couldn't take up questions. This but uh, if you have any questions, any problems, just do write to us with your problems and we'll be very happy to share with you our expertise around that. Thank you very much.